Um, I was given the task of discussing the office management of supraventricular arrhythmias, and supraventricular tachyarrhythmias are, of course, common rhythms, rarely lethal, but can be problematic to diagnose. So in order to know how to manage them, we need to review what they look like. The diagnosis of SVTs can be very fun, but can be often very onerous to try to figure out exactly what a patient's symptoms are and whether they're due to an SVT or not. And then we'll talk about the evaluation and management of these rhythms. Fortunately, the list of rhythms that you are likely to encounter is fairly limited and is included on this slide. Inappropriate sinus tachycardia is one that we see more often because it's frustrating for a primary care physician, and so we often are referred patients, and we'll discuss that. The paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardias are those that, by symptoms that the patient reports, are described as having a sudden onset and a sudden termination. And really, there are only three rhythms that make up the bulk of, of a PSVT, and that's the atrial tachycardias, the atrial ventricular nodal reentrant tachycardia, and the other major reentrant tachycardia, one that goes by the mouthful term of atrial ventricular reciprocating tachycardia. And that's the one that uses an accessory bypass pathway. Non-paroxysmal SVTs are also quite common, and again, atrial tachycardia is in this list because it can present both ways. Most often, atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are not described as being sudden onset and sudden offset by the patient. So we'll start with inappropriate sinus tachycardia. This is a rhythm that is most often seen in young, otherwise healthy individuals that's described as having a high resting heart rate of equal to or greater than 90 beats per minute a mean awake heart rate of being greater than 95 beats per minute, and is characterized by an increase in the heart rate from 25 to 35 beats per minute above the resting heart rate, simply from raising from the supine to the upright position. It's also characterized by an exaggerated rise in the exercise heart rate. And because the origin is the sinus node or near the sinus node, it is mediated by the autonomic nervous system and therefore has a warm-up and cool-down description by the patient when asked about their rhythm. If it has a sudden onset and offset by the patient's symptoms, it probably is not an inappropriate sinus tachycardia and suggests an alternate arrhythmia mechanism. The uh, mechanism underlying inappropriate sinus tachycardia is really not known, but thought to be related to one or more of the mechanisms listed here, which can include increased sympathetic tone, an increase in sympathetic receptor sensitivity, a blunted parasympathetic tone, a sympathovagal imbalance, or rarely might be due to an extra cardiac cause, such as a pheochromocytoma, if associated with episodes of hypertension, or an autonomic neuropathy. It also can overlap with one of the neurocardiogenic syncope syndrome variants, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. The hallmark on the electrocardiogram for inappropriate sinus tachycardia is that it looks like sinus tachycardia. So therefore, when examining the P wave, it looks like a normal sinus P wave, which is usually upright in the inferior limb leads, 2, 3, and AVF, and slightly positive or biphasic in V1, but then becomes positive throughout the rest of the precordium. And that can be distinguished from the P wave in patients who have an atrial tachycardia, as on this example. Atrial tachycardias can have a variety of heart rates, and at the more rapid heart rates can be difficult to even identify the P wave, and if the ventricular rate is 150 beats per minute, may be difficult to distinguish from atrial flutter. But if you can see the P waves, usually it will look different from the sinus node P wave morphology. So for instance, in this example, in the inferior limb leads, the P wave is actually negative, and these arrows have been displaced, I think, in the representation here from where they originally were, which is uh, where I'm going to show you with a pointer. So the P wave, for instance, in V1 in this example is now negative, slightly positive in V2, but then becomes flat in the rest of the precordium. Atrial tachycardias at slower rates are a little bit more easily identified in terms of the P wave morphology. So in this example, you can see that there's a deeply negative P wave in lead V1 that remains negative throughout most of the precordium until it transitions to an isoelectric P wave in the far lateral precordium. Also in the inferior leads, the P wave is flat, which would be not consistent with the normal P wave morphology. The atrial tachycardias can either be sudden onset, sudden offset, as I mentioned, or they can be of a different mechanism such that they also are mediated by the autonomic nervous system. So one of the characteristics that you might see is that as the tachycardia 
terminates, the R to R intervals increase and slow down prior to termination. So you can see the P wave that's abnormal. The rhythm breaks here to sinus rhythm. But then as it begins with this initiating P wave that's abnormal, the heart rate picks up. So the patient might describe that type of phenomenon. Atrial tachycardias are rhythms that are confined to the atrium. The rates can be quite variable, anywhere from a very rapid rate all the way to rather slow rates of 100 beats per minute, and account for about 10 to 15 percent of PSVTs referred to in electrophysiology laboratory. You can see this rhythm in all age groups, and it can be a primary arrhythmia disorder or associated with underlying heart disease um, in up to 90 percent of individuals that you might encounter, depending upon the age of patients in your practice. The types of underlying heart disease associated with atrial tachycardias are the common ones, coronary disease, cardiomyopathies, congenital heart disease, or valvular heart disease. The mechanism can be several fold, including a focal site of origin or a macro reentrant rhythm that involves a critical isthmus or a scar line, such as the scars that patients who have undergone surgical correction of congenital heart disease are left with and can at some point down the road present with an atrial tachycardia. Now, one of the most common rhythms you're likely to encounter is the most common cause of PSVT, which is AV nodal reentrant tachycardia. And this is a typical 12 lead electrocardiogram in a patient having this rhythm. It's characterized as a regular narrow QRS complex rhythm that has a sudden onset and a sudden offset. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll see a little notch following the QRS that disappears when the patient is no longer in their rhythm and you can examine their sinus rhythm electrocardiogram. And that little notch reflects the retrograde atrial activation of the rhythm. As I said, it is the most common form of PSVT, accounting for about 50 to 60 percent of all cases. It frequently occurs in young individuals without structural heart disease, but can also be seen in all ages and in individuals with organic heart disease. The rate of presentation is really quite variable, anywhere from about 130 all the way up to about 200 beats per minute. It requires dual AV nodal physiology, and we'll go over just what that is. The atrium and the ventricle are synchronously depolarized in this rhythm such that the location of the retrograde P waves are often not seen because it's buried within the QRS complex, or in the example that I showed you, it may distort the terminal portion of the QRS mm -hmm. complex. The AV conduction ratio is usually in a one-to-one -one pattern. So let's sort of review what dual AV nodal physiology is. It really is classic reentry. And in classic reentry, you need to have two pathways that can propagate depolarization down to a common exit point. So for instance, in this example, you would have a fast conducting pathway and a slowly conducting pathway, both of which have different refractory properties. So let's imagine that this is a sinus node depolarization coming down. It will hit both pathways, conduct down the fast conducting pathway, also across the slow conducting pathway, but it will reach the His bundle or the common exit point such that the slowly conducting propagating wave front will actually block. And this would give you a normal PR interval followed by depolarization of the ventricle. <clears throat> now let's say that there is an early atrial beat. It might find the fast pathway still refractory but it can conduct down the slow pathway and down, down to the His bundle, giving you a prolonged PR interval reflecting that slow pathway conduction. Now in patients who are capable of having PSVT due to AV node reentry tachycardia, what might happen is that as this propagating wavefront hits the His bundle, the fast pathway is now ready to receive a depolarization wavefront and it can do so in a retrograde manner and this sets up the opportunity for classic reentry with almost simultaneous depolarization, antegrade of the ventricle, and retrograde to the atrium. And if you're lucky enough to see the onset of this rhythm, the hallmark is a premature atrial contraction with a long PR interval that then begins the tachycardia. Well, the dual AV nodes are really not within the AV node proper in this rhythm. What we know, and you can see it on this picture, that demonstrates the right atrium here, tricuspid valve, and the right ventricle, is that the dual pathways are actually inputs into the compact AV node. The so-called fast pathway is found anterior to the AV node, while the slow pathway are conducting fibers that are found posterior to the AV node between the coronary sinus and the tricuspid annulus. And this is what allows this dual AV nodal physiology with these slow and fast inputs into the AV node.
Another similar rhythm is the other major reentrant rhythm accounting for PSVT. And this rhythm goes by the term AV reciprocating tachycardia, or for short, AVRT, that utilizes an accessory bypass pathway. On this 12-lead electrocardiogram, where the 12 leads are stacked on top of each other, you can see that it looks very similar to the other rhythm that I showed you previously. It is a sudden onset, sudden offset rhythm, characterized as a regular narrow complex tachycardia. If you can identify the retrograde P waves, they'll fall later than those noted in the previous rhythm because it's a macro reentrant circuit. It is the second most common form of PSVT, accounting for about 30 to 40 percent of the cases, and tends to have very rapid rates, almost reaching 300 beats per minute. Because of the rapid rates, you may see QRS alternins, or every other beat has a different voltage level in the QRS complex, and up to about 40 percent of patients. It absolutely requires the presence of an accessory bypass pathway, which you're most familiar with in the term WPW, which represents antegrade conduction across an accessory pathway and gives you the classic delta wave on the 12-lead electrocardiogram. However, people can have this rhythm and not have WPW or delta waves. In that situation, it's called a concealed accessory pathway, and only retrograde conduction is apparent. This is a macro reentrant arrhythmia. The accessory pathways exhibit rapid and non-decremental conduction. What that means is the normal AV node, of course, has decremental conduction. We all know that from the classic Wenke-Bach phenomenon, that as rapid rates input the AV node, before the AV node blocks, you'll see a decrementation or a slowing of conduction through the node. Accessory pathways don't work that way. They're either on or they're off. This rhythm can be triggered both by early atrial or early ventricular, extra stimuli or extra beats. And as I noted, the location of the P wave is always separated and following the QRS complex, if you're lucky enough to see it, on the electrocardiogram. AV conduction is always one-to-one. -one. Now, it's important to sort of remind ourselves, how do we get a delta wave on a 12-lead ECG? Because sometimes it can be confusing. So in this example, we have conduction starting at the sinus node. And in a patient who has an accessory pathway capable of antegrade conduction, that is conduction from the atrium to the ventricle, what you see on the 12-lead electrocardiogram is really a fusion of early excitation coming across the accessory pathway, exciting the ventricle in that area where the accessory pathway inputs the ventricle. Conduction also comes down through the normal AV node in his bundle. But it's pre-excited in the ventricle, and that pre-excitation is what draws the delta wave on the electrocardiogram and causes the short PR interval. And then conduction fuses with conduction coming through the normal conduction system to give you the final QRS complex. Now what happens when you have the arrhythmia? Well, conduction blocks antegrade in the accessory pathway, either because it's an early premature atrial um, beat or perhaps because of um, local autonomic tone, there's conduction in the accessory pathway antegrade. Conduction now comes down only through the AV node, but once it depolarizes the ventricle, it could conduct retrograde up through the accessory pathway and begin a macro reentrant tachycardia. And that is why for most individuals you will see they go from having a delta wave in sinus rhythm to no delta wave during the tachycardia because antegrade conduction is through the normal AV node conduction system. So just to be clear on our definitions, the Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome then is characterized by the triad of a delta wave, a short PR interval, and a tendency for a patient to have PSVT. Now I noted to you earlier that patients frequently can have PSVT with what's called a concealed accessory pathway. That is, they have an accessory pathway. They do not have delta waves on the 12-lead electrocardiogram. So in this example, you can see that the patient has sinus rhythm and no delta wave. Then they have a PVC. So this PVC will propagate retrogradely through the myocardium. It will try to enter the normal conduction system, but likely will collide with propagation coming down through the AV node, but might find the accessory pathway retrograde ready to accept a depolariz depolarizing wavefront. And this then also can set up a macro reentrant circuit, such that in this patient you would not see any difference in the QRS morphology from sinus rhythm to the onset of their arrhythmia.
And this is a better picture that gives you an idea of what a patient having a typical episode of PSVT would look like if you could actually see the macro rantern tachycardia. And again, antegrade conduction is through the AV node and retrograde up through the accessory pathway. Because the AV node is an obligate part of the pathway, just like an AV node reentrant tachycardia, strategies designed at slowing AV node conduction are therefore often successful at terminating the rhythm. This is why adenosine used acutely in an emergency room setting is highly successful, or teaching the patient vagal maneuvers might work for an individual. Oftentimes, you'll find that a young person has self-taught themselves vagal maneuvers as a way to terminate their arrhythmias. Pre-excitation can be seen in up to 0.25% of the general population. And of those patients, about 13% of them have more than one accessory pathway. Although normally a patient that you see is going to be the only one in their family that has evidence of an accessory pathway or WPW, there is a genetic predisposition such that there may be multiple family members affected. Pre-excitation can be intermittent. That means you can see it sometimes on a 12 lead, and you may not see it at other times, and it can disappear permanently over time. Accessory pathways are usually located on the left side of the heart, connecting the AV groove, and about one-third of them are located on the right side. Atrial fibrillation is also present in up to about 40% of patients with WPW, and this is the rhythm that carries a small risk of sudden cardiac death. So if the accessory pathway has a very short refractory period and rapid conduction, during atrial fibrillation, most of the depolarizing wavefronts will propagate across the accessory pathway and potentially could initiate ventricular fibrillation. A short RR interval on an electrocardiogram that is less than 250 milliseconds during atrial fibrillation has been correlated with sudden cardiac death. And it's always good to remind yourselves what WPW with atrial fibrillation looks like. And the hallmark is not only the classic R to R variability seen in all atrial fibrillation, but also variability of the QRS morphology, which reflects varying degrees of conduction across the accessory pathway versus fusion over the normal AV node conduction system. Now let's go on to a very common rhythm, which is atrial flutter. And of course, the common presentation on a 12-lead electrocardiogram is characterized by these sawtooth atrial depolarizations, which are best seen in the inferior limb leads. Common atrial flutter is also a reentrant arrhythmia. It is confined to the atrium, and in this view, the oval circles represent the tricuspid valve annulus, and it's a regular rhythm with an atrial rate between 250 and 350 beats per minute, and classic flutter is dependent upon something that we call the caval tricuspid isthmus. And it is an area of tissue that is located between the tricuspid valve annulus, the inferior vena cava, and the typical propagating wavefront is counterclockwise. It has to go through this area of tissue. And that's what makes it amenable to catheter ablation, as I'll show you when we talk about the management of the rhythm. There are variants, however. For instance, it can go the other way, be clockwise in orientation, or it's not isthmus dependent at all and is propagating around the superior vena cava or in the left atrium or around the scar. Atrial fibrillation is, of course, the most common supraventricular arrhythmia any of us will see and is, of course, characterized by variation in the R to R interval and no organized atrial activity. The mechanism of atrial fibrillation is, is interesting. It is based upon the multiple wavelet theory, but it is triggered by either premature atrial beats that come from around pulmonary veins or in areas of the right atrium, or can be triggered by other atrial arrhythmias. And then it is maintained by either motor, mother rotors anchored around the pulmonary veins, or because there's atrial fibrosis and non-homogeneous conduction around anatomic electrical boundaries, and often also by influence of the autonomic nervous system. It is the most common symptomatic arrhythmia that a physician will encounter. In the United States in 1995, there was an estimated 2 million individuals with atrial fibrillation in this country, which by 2006 had reached 5 million. It is also a rhythm that increases in prevalence as individuals age. So both for women and men, women in the light bars, men in the dark bars, as age increases, so does the prevalence of atrial fibrillation. And in fact, 
4% of patients over the age of 65 are found to have had at least one episode of atrial fibrillation, and this increases to 15% in individuals over the age of 75, and can be found in 16% of elderly individuals hospitalized for heart failure. The consequences of atrial fibrillation are significant and include increased mortality, which is associated both with the arrhythmia as well as the therapy, increased mor morbidity, a reduced quality of life, and is certainly an economic burden as it is the most common arrhythmia leading to hospitalization, which puts a stress on our limited health care resources. There are both acute and chronic conditions that are associated with atrial fibrillation. Some of the acute conditions include alcohol, post-op surgical, acute myocardial infarction, pericarditis or myocarditis, or pulmonary emboli, as well as, of course, hyperthyroidism. Chronic states associated with atrial fibrillation include heart failure, coronary disease, hypertension, both hypertrophic and dilated cardiomyopathies, congenital and valvular heart disease, and can also be seen in patients with pulmonary disease. So-called lone atrial fibrillation accounts for about 30% of all atrial fibrillation. One could argue about the term lone, as clearly there is something amiss in the atrium that predisposes a patient to atrial fibrillation. But this term lone refers to the fact that you cannot identify any other um, evidence of organic heart disease in that individual. Atrial fibrillation is a particular problem in heart failure because the two interact in a negative way. So for instance, Patients with atrial fibrillation have loss of AV synchrony, have a rapid ventricular response, have R to R variability, and have to endure the toxicity of antiarrhythmic drugs, all of which can worsen heart failure. On the other hand, heart failure is associated with increased volume and pressure overload, abnormalities in the myocardium that result in interstitial fibrosis, altered atrial refractory properties, and heterogeneity of conduction, all of which can lead to atrial fibrillation. The prevalence of atrial fibrillation increases with severity of heart failure. And on this slide are shown um, examples from multiple heart, rhythm, or excuse me, heart failure trials that included patients from class 1 New York Heart Association up through class 4 New York Heart Association individuals. And it demonstrates that with increasing heart failure severity, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation in these trials also increased. The definitions of atrial fibrillation patterns have been changing over the course of the last several years. So now we call recurrent atrial fibrillation any individual who has had a second episode of atrial fibrillation. Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation refers to those individuals who terminate spontaneously from an episode, while persistent atrial fibrillation is a term that refers to those who terminate after seven days, including termination with cardioversion or drug therapy. The term permanent atrial fibrillation has replaced the term chronic atrial fibrillation and refers to all individuals who have had um, permanent atrial fibrillation following failed cardioversion or in those individuals in whom there's going to be no attempt to terminate atrial fibrillation. These patterns are not mutually exclusive, however. And in fact, patients can go back and forth after the first detected episode and are usually described by the most frequent presentation, be it either paroxysmal or persistent and many patients ultimately develop permanent atrial fibrillation. Probably the most important aspect of atrial fibrillation is the risk of ischemic stroke, which is 17 times the risk in normal individuals without atrial fibrillation in patients with rheumatic mitral valve disease. It is three to five times the risk of a normal individual without atrial fibrillation in non-valvular AF with an incidence of 5% per year. However, it's influenced significantly by the individual patient characteristics. So for instance, the risk is quite low in a patient with lone atrial fibrillation, whereas it is very high in the elderly, greater than 85 years of age, where the risk is 20% per year. And in fact, half of all AF-related strokes occur in individuals over the age of 75. Up until 1990, anticoagulation therapy for individuals with atrial fibrillation was really relegated to those patients who had had a prior stroke or patients with rheumatic mitral valve disease. However, 26 studies were performed in the late 1980s through the early 1990s and over 20,000 patients that firmly established the role of warfarin therapy for prevention of stroke. The five most well-known studies are shown here with the meta-analysis of these trials. And on this hazard ratio plot, warfarin being better than placebo is on the left side. 
And you can see that the point estimate for the hazard ratios demonstrates convincingly that warfarin is better than no warfarin at preventing strokes. And this was associated with a risk reduction of 61%. Now, aspirin was also evaluated. Warfarin was compared with aspirin, which is demonstrated on this hazard ratio plot, which for most trials demonstrated that warfarin was better than aspirin in decreasing the risk of stroke. Aspirin was also compared to placebo in a number, a number of trials, which was better than nothing, but only associated with a 19% reduction in stroke risk compared to the much greater reduction in stroke risk provided by warfarin therapy. One of the important aspects of those trials was the identifying risk factors that placed a patient at high risk for a stroke, and that included a history of prior stroke, a TIA, or a systemic embolus, an older age greater than 75, the presence of hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, coronary disease, and the female gender. The other important aspect out of these trials was well, what is the appropriate level of warfarin therapy measured by the INR. And this clearly demonstrated that an INR between 2 and 3 was associated with the greatest reduction in stroke risk, but still minimized intracranial bleeding as the hazard of an increasing INR. And in fact, the stroke risk, or excuse me, the hemorrhagic bleeding complication from warfarin is actually very low and was about 1.2% across the board in all of these trials. And in more contemporary trials, it's even less, on the order of about 0.6%, really demonstrating that warfarin therapy is safe. Unfortunately, for a long time, the use of warfarin in eligible patients was really underused. From the um, trials looked at in the early 1990s to late 1990s, only about 55% of eligible patients were receiving warfarin and was worst in the eldest patient population, those probably most likely to benefit from warfarin therapy. It's better, but still we undertreat patients, and it's better because guidelines came out, both in 2001, which were a little confusing, and a new set of guidelines in 2006, which really helped define whether to use warfarin therapy or aspirin based upon risk factors. What the writers of these guidelines did was to go back and look at all the risk factors and identify them as high, moderate, or less validated, or weaker risk factors. The high risk factors continued to be previous stroke, TIA, or other embolic um, episodes, mitral stenosis, or prosthetic heart valve disease. Moderate risk factors included older age, but you'll note that now the age cutoff is equal to or greater than 75 years of age, not the prior 65 years of age. Hypertension, the presence of heart failure, a low ejection fraction equal to or less than 35%, and the presence of diabetes were all identified as being moderate risk factors. Less validated or weaker risk factors included female gender, an age between 66 and 74 years of age, the presence of coronary disease, or thyrotoxicosis. Then they looked at what the hazard ratio or the actual risk for events was related to each of these factors and assigned them a score, which is now known as the CHADS-2 scoring system. So for patients with the highest risk of a prior stroke or TIA, two points were given to that risk factor, and one point was given to the other moderate risk factors. This then went into a recommendation for use of either aspirin or warfarin, such that if a patient had no risk factors, either nothing or an aspirin could be used. If a patient had one moderate risk factor, aspirin could be used, or as a class 2A indication, warfarin at a therapeutic INR could be recommended. But a patient with any high risk factor or greater than one moderate risk factor, the recommendation is for warfarin therapy. Now remember that any patient undergoing cardioversion must be anticoagulated, even if they chronically aren't anticoagulated with warfarin. And the recommendation is for a minimum of three weeks at a therapeutic INR prior to the cardioversion using warfarin and four weeks following cardioversion for patients with atrial fibrillation of unknown duration or longer than 48 hours. But be careful about this 48 hours. Take a very careful history in your patients because oftentimes they really aren't that clear about the onset of atrial fibrillation. And if you have to err, err on the side of anticoagulating those patients. If you don't think they can wait the four to five weeks because it's going to take that long to get them therapeutic for three weeks on Coumadin, then you might want to consider referring them for a different approach using a transesophageal echocardiogram to rule out thrombus in the left atrial appendage combined with heparin bridge to Coumadin.
Now let's talk about the evaluation and management of these common rhythms. The symptoms that patients are likely to present with really can be a multitude. They can include palpitations, I feel flip-flops in my chest, I feel fluttering, I have dizzy or lightheaded spells. Syncope is rare, but occasionally patients can present with syncope with very high rate PSVT, near syncope, and sometimes patients are diagnosed with anxiety or panic attacks and they're really having an arrhythmia. Unfortunately, the reverse is probably more often true. Sometimes patients don't have a classic symptom suggestive of an arrhythmia, but have episodic shortness of breath, chest pain, or fatigue. And then there are those patients who are asymptomatic because they have auto rate control or they're already on beta blockers for another reason and have atrial fibrillation and atrial tachycardia or show up in your office and have a WPW pattern on the electrocardiogram but no history of arrhythmias. The evaluation for supraventricular tachycardia fortunately is limited to a very few number of tests. The first step, of course, is an electrocardiogram to look for the presence of delta waves, to make sure that their symptoms simply aren't due to frequent premature ventricular or atrial beats, rule out ventricular arrhythmias as a possibility, such as looking for the long QT syndrome, where polymorphic VT would be the cause of palpitations and obviously would be a much more concerning rhythm diagnosis. A Holter monitor is only useful if patients have frequent symptoms because they have to have their rhythm within the 24-hour time frame in which you're obtaining that Holter. So oftentimes you need to use an event monitor, of which we have two choices, a king of hearts or a so-called loop recorder or a heart card. The loop recorder is more useful because at the point in which the patient presses the button, it'll go back and capture 10 to 20 seconds prior to the onset of that arrhythmia. But both of these approaches require that the patients have symptoms prior to their events and can quickly press the button. An alternate might be an implantable loop recorder, and this would be indicated after the patient has had a thorough workup with other strategies. But if at the end of the day, the patient still has distressing symptoms and you're not sure if they do or do not have a real arrhythmia and other um, more significant arrhythmias have been ruled out, an implantable loop recorder might be reasonable. It can be done with a very tiny incision, about a centimeter. The batteries now in these things last up to three years. They can be programmed to capture certain um, heart rates, both on the low end and the high end. It can be very useful at ruling in or out rhythms. Probably as useful at ruling out rhythms as they are in, because frequently a patient having distressing symptoms, you can reassure them that only sinus rhythm was identified on their loop recorder. Most patients with new diagnosis of a supraventricular tachycardia are going to require an echocardiogram to rule out structural heart disease. In the patient who shows up with rapid rates above 100 beats per minute, you want to make sure that their left ventricular function is normal because certainly patients with persistent tachycardias can develop a tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, which will resolve following appropriate therapy for the rhythm abnormality. Patients with exercise-induced rhythm should undergo a stress test to see if that can bring out the rhythm and further help in the diagnosis. Now, the treatment of all of these rhythms is really targeted at treating any underlying triggers and medical illnesses, pharmacologic approaches, and then referral for procedure evaluation and therapy. The medication list is really small that we have to use. The most common drugs, of course, are the AV nodal blocking agents, which are highly effective for a number of these rhythms and include beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and sometimes digoxin is useful. Otherwise, we're looking at using antiarrhythmic drug therapy of the class 1 or class 3 variety. The class 1C drugs are the most useful, fleconide and propafenone. However, they're contraindicated in any individual with coronary artery disease or structural heart disease. The class 3 drugs are useful, and those include sodalol and dofetilide. Both of them are QT prolonging drugs, must be started as an inpatient, and you obviously can't use it in somebody who already has a baseline prolonged QT interval. And finally, amiodarone, which is also a class 3 antiarrhythmic drug, but has class 1, 2, and 4 properties also, is probably the most useful drug that we have. So let's go back to our list of SVTs and start back with inappropriate sinus tachycardia. The most important thing to do is to document that it's truly inappropriate with an electrocardiogram and a Holter to treat any underlying reversible causes such as anemia, hypo or hyperglycemia, thyroid abnormalities, dehydration, any stimulants or drug effects. And then it's quite reasonable to offer these individuals a trial of therapy with either a beta blocker or calcium channel blocker. Unfortunately, these people are often highly symptomatic. They're young individuals, often quite anxious about how they feel, 
and they either don't tolerate beta blockers or calcium channel blockers or don't feel that they're effective. And so a referral to either a neurologist for autonomic testing, a cardiac or electrophysiologist for tilt table testing if you think they're actually a neurocardiogenic syncope variant, the POTS syndrome. Or if they have a history of sudden onset offset, it probably isn't inappropriate sinus tachycardia anyway, and you might want us to take a look at that patient more closely. Atrial tachycardias begin also the same way. We want to treat any reversible underlying causes and evaluate the patient for underlying organic heart disease. With these individuals, it's also reasonable to begin with antiarrhythmic drug therapy that affects the AV node so that the ventricular rate response is slower and more manageable for that patient. So beta blockers and calcium channel blockers can be used quite effectively in a number of these patients. If those fail, however, you really are looking at referral to a cardiologist and possibly electrophysiologist for further therapy that's going to include the class 1 or class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs or potentially EP evaluation with catheter ablation. Radiofrequency catheter ablation for some atrial tachycardias actually can be highly effective. So those rhythms that have a single spot that you can identify somewhere in the heart can be mapped and ablated. The common sites, fortunately, are places that we can get to with catheters. Most of these occur on the right side of the heart, either along the crista terminalis, in the interatrial septum, at the os of the coronary sinus, in the right atrial appendage, around the superior vena cava. On the left side, they're found around the mitral annulus, around the ostea of the pulmonary veins at the left atrial appendage or in the left atrial free wall. And the success rates are actually quite high in this type of atrial tachycardia with a fairly low rate of recurrence. So it's clearly something to think about in a patient who doesn't tolerate or fails antiarrhythmic drugs. In general, mapping of focal arrhythmias is done with these lovely color-coded maps where we move a catheter around one of the cardiac chambers during the tachycardia. And when the catheter is at the site of origin of that arrhythmia, it's going to color code it red. And so then we can direct our ablation catheter right to the correct spot, ablate that area, and hopefully cure the arrhythmia. Management of the PSVTs begins also with some strategy directed at the AV node. If the patient has frequent rhythm episodes, you're probably going to need to use beta blockers or calcium shadow blockers or refer that patient for ablation. Certainly the patient with a very rare arrhythmia can be taught bagel maneuvers. And if they show up in an emergency room, adenosine is a very appropriate urgent management strategy. For patients who have AVRT, and you're only going to know that they for sure have that if they have no pre-excitation on a 12 lead. If they have pre-excitation on a 12 lead or a delta wave, all of these patients should be referred for ablation because of the potential risk from atrial fibrillation. If they have no pre-excitation on a 12 lead ECG, really you're going to be thinking about these rhythms as being the same rhythm unless you were lucky enough to see retrograde atrial activity that makes you think that this patient has an accessory pathway. Regardless, beta blockers can be used safely, and if beta blockers fail, those patients also should be referred for ablation. Furthermore, any patient who is in a high-risk situation or an athlete who has highly symptomatic episodes of PSVT should be referred for ablation. Now what about asymptomatic WPW? Those patients should at least be seen by the electrophysiologist and receive an evaluation. It doesn't necessarily mean that we'll take them to the lab and ablate them and get rid of their delta wave. If they truly have no arrhythmias, we think that they're in a low risk situation, we may do nothing for them, but they should be seen and evaluated. Now, radiofrequency ablation for AV node reentrant tachycardia targets the slow pathway. So in this diagram, here is the AV node, here is the fast pathway, and here is the slow pathway. And we simply find this area and ablate it. This is a very safe procedure. The incidence of high-grade AV block, even though we're fairly close to the AV node, is low, less than 0.4%, with very high success rates of 99% and very low recurrence rates. Radiofrequency ablation for accessory AV pathways is also highly successful. On the right side, they're performed by placing your catheter on the atrial side of the tricuspid valve. On the left side, the catheter can either come up around the aorta and come up underneath the mitral valve and ablate the targeted area, or more commonly now, it's performed by doing a transeptal puncture and bringing the catheter across from the right atrium into the left atrium and then mapping on the atrial side of the mitral annulus. Regardless, it's also a highly successful procedure, a 96% success rate with a very low complication rate. Now, atrial flutter is also a rhythm that can be managed by catheter ablation quite easily. And it's important to remember that because other approaches generally fail. 
For one thing, rate control is really difficult in patients with atrial flutter. It's much more easily done in atrial fibrillation. You can try beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin is probably useless. But either way, unless the patient has intrinsic AV node disease, it's going to be very difficult to block that patient down. Rhythm control can be successful, but then again, you're potentially treating somebody whose only rhythm abnormality is atrial flutter with a potentially toxic antiarrhythmic drug of the class 1C, or again, amiodarone, sotalol, or dofetilide variety. So I would really encourage people to consider referring a patient with classic atrial flutter for radiofrequency ablation because we can ablate that little section that I showed you, the so-called caval tricuspid isthmus, successfully 95 to 99% of the time with a low recurrence rate. And because we're on the right side of the heart and away from important structures, the complication rates are very low. You can also consider this in patients who have both atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation, because they tend to be more symptomatic from their atrial flutter than their atrial fibrillation, again, because it's difficult to rate control. And a combination approach with successful atrial flutter ablation with antiarrhythmic drug therapy for the atrial fibrillation can be very successful. And the way it's done is this is the tricuspid annulus, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. We place a so-called halo catheter, a mapping catheter, right around the tricuspid annulus, a reference catheter in the coronary sinus, and then we simply bring in an ablation catheter that ablates a line between the inferior vena cava and the tricuspid annulus. So again, it's a fairly straightforward procedure associated with very low risk and a high success rate. Management of atrial fibrillation, of course, is really the more difficult rhythm, and it requires multiple strategies. First, of course, we always want to address the underlying organic heart disease and make sure that that is adequately treated. The first step is always rate control, because rate control alone can render a symptomatic patient asymptomatic, and that's often all you need to do. But you need to document that you have adequate rate control by getting a Holter monitor. You don't want to just depend upon a resting 12 lead at 80 beats per minute. You want to make sure that with their normal activities, they're clearly rate controlled. Stroke prevention, we've already discussed. Cardioversion, if appropriate, needs to be considered. And finally, a decision regarding long-term management with rate control versus a rhythm control strategy needs to be thought about. Most patients with newly diagnosed atrial fibrillation should probably have at least one cardiology consultation. Rate control is predominantly with AV nodal agents. In some patients in whom you're going to leave them in persistent atrial fibrillation and no strategy works with drugs, taking out their AV node with an ablation strategy and implanting a pacemaker can be a very effective way to manage those patients. Rhythm controls with the same group of drugs that we've been talking about, but there is another strategy for patients with paroxysmal AFib, and they don't have it very often, and that's the so-called pill-in-the-pocket approach, where you might provide the patient a prescription for a single dose of an AV nodal blocking agent, or if that doesn't work, the FDA approved indications for this type of therapy include single dose flecainide or single dose propathenone in patients who don't have a contraindication to these drugs. Usually when I use this approach, I hospitalize the patient the first time I'm going to do that to make sure that it really is safe in, in, in an individual patient and then give them the prescription. They know to take a single dose at the onset of their arrhythmia, and this often is a very effective way of keeping the patient out of the emergency room or your office. Now, what about rhythm or rate control? Well, the AFFIRM trial was a large NIH multicenter trial that most of you are probably familiar with that was a mortality endpoint, and no difference between a rate or a rhythm strategy was identified. However, there is some suggestion that there are reasons to think about keeping people in sinus rhythm. And that is because the longer you're in atrial fibrillation, the longer you're going to be in it, and the more difficult it is to get out of it. So in now a famous animal study, even animals that were only in atrial fibrillation for a few hours were identified as having permanent and irreversible changes that occurred in their atrium, which included shortening of the atrial refractory period, which makes a patient more likely to perpetuate atrial fibrillation, changes in conduction velocities, changes in gap junction density and heterogeneity, increased intracellular fibrosis, and myofibril disarray. So that at least raises the stakes that perhaps if we had better strategies at managing atrial fibrillation with less toxic approaches, it might be reasonable to push on an approach that maintains sinus rhythm. Part of the reason is drugs just simply don't work very well. In two well-known trials from Roy and Crines, the ability of any single drug to maintain sinus rhythm out to a year is really very poor. So with propafinone and Sola, two very good drugs, the chance of being being still in sinus rhythm at one year is 50%. Even with amiodarone, the best drug we have, the chance is only about 
And if a patient has failed two drugs, a third drug is probably not going to work. The chance of that individual maintaining sinus rhythm is about 20% or less. So what about this exciting new approach that you've all heard about, radiofrequency ablation for atrial fibrillation? It has been performed now for about a decade, it's becoming more common, and certainly is uh, something that hits the press, and it interests many patients with this very disconcerting and often highly symptomatic arrhythmia. It is an approach that targets the pulmonary vein. So this is a view of the posterior left atrium. And of course, there are four pulmonary veins. It's beginning in about 2000, the approach was to isolate these pulmonary veins. Usually a large ablation circumferential line is drawn around the four pulmonary veins and sometimes some connecting lesions. In highly selected individuals, and that usually means patients with minimal or no underlying heart disease with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who have failed antiarrhythmic drug therapy and are highly symptomatic and tell you they just can't live with this rhythm any longer, the success rates can be very high, up to 80%. But oftentimes, patients require a second procedure. In patients with persistent atrial fibrillation, in certain high volume centers, they are also reporting a success rate of up to 80%. And our rates here at the University of Washington are similar, again, in selected patients. Why do I keep emphasizing selected patients? Because the complication rate is not minuscule. It's about 4%, but the types of complications are significant. Stroke, pulmonary vein stenosis, the emergence of new tachycardias, and some very distressing side effects of gastroparesis because we can knock out the parasympathetic input to the left atrium. And there have been reports of people who have died from fistula being developed between the aorta and the back of the left atrium. And furthermore, we have no mortality data yet to tell us that this is a better strategy. However, mortality data is coming. The NIH is going to fund a very large trial coming up in the next several years that perhaps will help us understand further which patients are best candidates for this approach. But it's not going to go away. The technique is getting better and the success rate's higher. But again, it's for limited patients only currently. So in conclusion, the evaluation of most supraventricular tachycardias can be limited to a good history and physical exam, a 12-lead ECG, rhythm monitoring, and an echocardiogram for most individuals. Many paroxysmal SVTs can be managed with simple approaches, such as AV nodal blocking agents or the pill-in-the-pocket approach. The primary atrial arrhythmias, such as atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, and atrial fibrillation most often occur in the setting of structural heart disease. Medications are generally well tolerated, but can be ineffective, or if you're up in the level of the 1C or class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs, can result in significant side effects. Radiofrequency ablation, particularly for PSVT and classic atrial flutter, is highly effective with a low complication rate. And radiofrequency ablation for atrial fibrillation is increasingly effective, but outcome data is currently lacking. Thank you for your time. So we have a few minutes for questions. If you have any questions, uh, please come to the microphone so we can get those um, on our tape. Please. Yes, sir. A couple questions. I continue to be confused in regard to the use of aspirin. Um, cardiologists have a great statement, oh, just take aspirin, and then the patient comes back to primary care and say, which aspirin? were they talking about? Um, well, that's whether... because it's not clear from the guidelines. If you remember the slide I showed you, it said 81 milligrams or full aspirin because there isn't enough data okay. to support one approach or another. So both are allowed. And, and Europe seems to be using you know, a different dose, like 150. Yeah, so, an in-between dose. So do we give 281s following I think what that you again? can say is either approach is acceptable because there simply isn't the data to okay. tell you whether 81 milligrams is enough or not enough. Okay. And then also, uh, in regard to all the causes of AF, let alone the uh, maybe obesity, hypertensive, et cetera, um, but I've had a couple patients who then have had breast cancer and had chemotherapy and then end up in AFib after that event. Is there any evidence in regard to chemotherapy being another risk factor? Well, it's probably associated with the effects of the chemotherapy, either okay. to have caused a cardiomyopathy or some other radiation, if they have radiation in combination with chemotherapy. The um, chemotherapeutic drugs, when acutely given, often are associated with episodes of atrial fibrillation, and that's not an uncommon consultation that we're asked to see those patients. So yes, there is an association. And, and actually, strategies at treating those patients can be difficult. 
Thank you. Other questions? This is something that uh, I know all of you in the audience see, particularly atrial fibrillation patients or the patients who are complaining of palpitations, and I know it's something we commonly see as well. I think one of the things that uh, that Jeannie pointed out is that there's been, at least in my mind, some um, improvement in the guidelines, uh, particularly around the risk. Before it was just a laundry list of, of things and you, you couldn't give any, everything was equally weighted. So it was like if you had one of them, you got anticoagulated with Coumadin. And I don't know about you, but my patients, uh, I have very few patients who raise their hand and say, please put me on, on warfarin. So you know that's always a discussion you have <laughs> with patients. Um, and I think the more recent guidelines uh, bring a little bit of, um, make it a little bit easier uh, from the standpoint of determining who is high risk and who really needs to be on uh, Coumadin anticoagulation. So any comments about that, Jeannie? Oh, I think it's been great to have them clearly outlined. It's much easier to go look at that table and simply try to identify whether your patient has a moderate risk factor or a high risk factor. And um, it's a lot easier to make the choice and it's easier to then have the conversation with the patient and really convince them that warfarin's the right answer if they have a high risk factor. When you looked at those studies, they suggested previous risk factors, diabetes, right. pressure. But I'm kind of concerned about the individual who has ongoing risk factors because of their activities. And I'm thinking particularly of a, a very healthy cyclist who was an AFib, is a warfarin, and had a fall and had a fatal uh, in a cranial bleed. So what, what should we do about this? How do we factor in the person's ongoing lifestyle as to whether they should be on warfarin or not? Well, if the patient has a high risk factor, I think you have to tell the patient that warfarin is what you're going to recommend to them because their risk of ischemic stroke is quite high and they may need to modify their lifestyle. If they fall into that moderate risk factor, I think it's okay to have that conversation with them because really you could offer somebody like that who is in a highly active position or you know competitive athlete aspirin over warfarin but I think we're obligated to tell the patient that warfarin is what's recommended if they have a significant risk factor if they choose to continue to be in a you know bungee jumping or glide <laughs> whatever that gliding thing Falling in the air as the people do <laughs> this looks very scary right. I guess they take their risk any update, Jeannie, on, I know we had some hope several years ago that we would have a replacement for uh, warfarin. I know that uh, that drug uh, was re actually not released in this country and then released in Europe and then taken off the market in Europe as well. So anything on the horizon from the standpoint of something that's easier to use than Coumadin? Well, I hope so. I mean, there are studies coming out. I guess we'll have to see if they make it past the toxicity since the melagantrin bit the dust. Unfortunately, we were all hoping that it would be released and we could use that in patients because they wouldn't have had to have INRs checked frequently like warfarin and didn't have the problem with having to avoid eating spinach. <laughs> yeah. so. or, or even the dosing issues too. And the I dosing, think it's a very dose different. A single well. dose, right. That, yeah, would be, that would be great. I think some of those kinds of patients would be more likely to want to take it. And, and one other question. You alluded to the, um, the, the uh, toxicity of our current uh, drugs. Uh, you know, amiodarone is a pretty good drug, but has a significant toxicity profile. And patients here in Seattle have a tendency to look at Google and to Google all this and come in saying, I'm not taking that drug, uh, no matter what you tell me. Uh, any other, any, I know there's some new things on the horizon from the standpoint of better understanding. What, we, what we've done in the past is sort of given these drugs, uh, they have lots of toxicities, they have sort of a wide effect on, on the electrophysiology of the heart. Any comments on what might be coming down the pike, so to speak, in the next several years that would be more intelligent drugs? Well, there are a number of drugs that are being looked at, sort of son or daughters of amiodarone, um, that perhaps will come out that have a lower toxicity profile because they are trying to use a drug that drops the iodine moiety. Um, I think in terms of using amiodarone, you just need to remember that any patient on amiodarone really does need close follow-up. The most significant toxicity is pulmonary fibrosis, which in patients on a moderate dose, 300 to 400 milligrams a day, is going to be about a 3 to 4 percent risk. And currently, there is no one strategy for evaluating those patients. We tend to use the diffusing capacity here because it's um, a test that you can do without radiation exposure. But your DLCO can drop for all sorts of reasons, uh, especially heart failure. So in any patient who does have drop in their DLCO, and if they aren't demonstrated to have heart failure as the cause, they should have a high resolution fast CT scan, which is really the next um, step in the diagnosis. So that's the most important thing. The risk is actually quite low if you have patients on 100 to 200 milligrams per day. It's probably down on the order of about 1%, so actually very low. 
even though it gets a lot of hype. More commonly, of course, is hypo or hyper, hyperthyroidism, which can be difficult to manage. Um, it can affect certainly the liver function studies, although rarely do you need to stop the drug for a mild elevation in LFTs. And the other interesting topic is its effect on the eyes, which of course got a lot of press um, a number of years ago for the possible association of optic neuritis, which is unilateral blindness, um, not a small side effect that was connected to amiodarone. Um, you know, that data probably wasn't real solid, and there is some evidence that the risk of optic neuritis and amiodarone is either truly very, very tiny, possibly non-existent, but we're obligated to inform our patients of that risk when we start them on, them on amiodarone because it is listed in the PDR and in FDA guidelines that you must counsel your patients on that risk. Gene testing for people who have variable, variable responses to Coumadin. I'm, I don't know that that's a clinically um, available no. study right now at all. I mean, I think that in many arenas we're going to have a lot that will help us down the road as some of these novel approaches that really identify um, individuals with different m metabolic pathways, et cetera, um, will help guide our therapy. But currently those strategies are not clinically available. Right. And I think the other thing, too, as we look at that, I think it's a it's almost the holy grail of um, drug therapy is this, this sort of targeted drug therapy for individuals who have either predispositions not to respond to certain drugs from a genetic uh, predisposition or would respond nicely to certain drugs. I think, again, there's a lot of um, discussion about that, but there's a lot of polymorphisms in those uh, areas of the genes, and so it's not nearly as clear-cut, I think, as what you see uh, in the common uh, common press and the front page of the New York Times, which loves to put things um, on there that gets attention. So I think it's, there are some possibilities there, but you know, this, this tailored therapy, um, certainly a great idea. I'm not sure when we'll get there, but I know that's been recently in the press as well. So I think we'll go ahead and conclude, and uh, thanks very much, Jeannie, for your great presentation.